Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Last episode, we witnessed the peculiar conclusion to the First Anglo-Ashanti War. The war's peculiar course, starting with an overwhelming Ashanti victory and ending in a bunglesome stalemate, ensured that the peace that ended the war would be anything but conclusive. The Ashanti ceded their shaky sovereignty over the coast to the British in exchange for an incredibly favorable trade deal and the unequivocal acceptance of Ashanti ownership of Achim and Asan. This episode, we look further into the later reign of Oseya Akoto, the Ashanti Hene who helmed the Ashanti state throughout the tumultuous Anglo-Ashanti War, and examine his reign after the conclusion of peace. Season 3, Episode 18, Ashanti Hene Oseya Akoto and his struggles with palm wine. A drunkard is worse than a madman. So goes an Akan proverb. Alcohol, while a tempting mistress, is something that should only be consumed in moderation. When consumed in excess, alcohol can turn even the most mentally balanced person into a cruel or stupid mess of a human being. This belief is common in many cultures, and the Akan cultures of Ghana emphasized it quite strongly. Today, Ghana has a widespread and visible commercial alcohol market, but in the pre-colonial days, excess consumption of the drink was much more taboo. Typically, the social custom for the Akan was for the local drunks to be treated as social pariahs by their town or village. And, if you've ever tried traditional Akan liquor, you'd see why Akan culture emphasized restraint in drinking. The traditional Akan liquor, known in Chui as Nsim, but today widely known by its Ga name, Akpeteshi, was created through the fermentation of date palm sap. Akpeteshi is notoriously strong, often featuring alcohol content north of 60%. For reference to that strength, a standard vodka doesn't typically surpass 40%. I asked a friend of mine who had drank Akpeteshi before what it felt like. He responded, getting punched in the neck. The drink's sappy origins also give it a uniquely sweet taste among hard liquor, lightly doling the drink's high alcohol content and making it surprisingly easy for somebody to down copious amounts of the powerful beverage, despite its intense side effects. Not to mention, the drink was cheap and easy to make. Akan distilling techniques were particularly efficient, with many Ashanti peasants making the product as basically a hobby in their spare time. As a result, the drink developed a reputation as a common people's beverage, something for the working class to enjoy in intense moderation during social gatherings. People of high status, on the other hand, drank expensive imported rum, known for its milder alcohol content and smoother taste. With all that said, let's flash back a little bit and return to the life of the subject of this episode, Osei Ya Akoto. The youngest child of Konodo Yadom's mini dynasty, and soon to be the eighth ruler of the Ashanti Empire, had always been something of a black sheep in his family. Unlike his brothers, each of whom were given the expectation of holding power and achieving great things someday, nobody expected the young Oseya to amount to much. He was given the nickname by his peers that would stick with him throughout the rest of his life, a double-meaning nickname Oseya Akoto. Ose, the red-toned skin, after an embarrassing skin condition he had, as well as Ose, the guy who begs for approval. However, after an unfortunate spree of early deaths among his brothers, Ose Yaakoto inherited the golden stool from his esteemed and respected brother, Ose Bonso. That said, he also inherited leadership over the Ashanti's first major war with the British. Under his brother's leadership, the Ashanti won multiple one-sided victories and seemed ready to finish off the British once and for all. But under the command of Oseya Koto, the Ashanti military won a mixed record, winning some battles but notably losing a major battle at Katamanso in 1826. It's worth noting as well that one of the Ashanti armies was led by Oseya Koto himself, and that the victories in the war largely happened in spite of his numerous tactical blunders, while he was directly culpable in some of the Ashanti's worst defeats. Five years later, after fighting drew down to a stalemate, the British and Ashanti forged a peace agreement. While the agreement was somewhat favorable to the Ashanti, it was incredibly disappointing compared to what the triumphant victories of his brother promised to deliver. Regardless of the actual merits of the peace agreement, Oseya Koto's failures during the war would follow him like a specter for the rest of his life. Since birth, Oseya Koto had played sixth fiddle to his brothers. While they were heirs to an empire, he was the weird kid with maroon skin. 
His brother Osebonso had fulfilled his high expectations, becoming the most effective Ashanti military leader since, well, maybe Osetutu himself. And, after his chance to end all the ridicule and finally gain the respect he had yearned for so dearly, Oseyakoto had face-planted. No matter how hard he tried to be another Ose the Whale, he would always be Ose who begs for approval. After his battlefield failures became publicized in 1826, Nishantahene's already fragile self-image collapsed, and he fell into a profoundly resentful depression. And, like many who suffer from intense emotional anguish, Oseya Koto turned to the bottle. At first, he consumed high volumes of rum to numb his pain. While the mass drinking was taboo, at least he was consuming a drink appropriate for a man of his royal stature. But throughout the early years of intense alcoholism, his body began to develop a resistance to the intoxicating substance. Soon, even copious amounts of rum could not keep him sufficiently inebriated to chase away his demons. So, he turned to the more potent drink of the peasants and enslaved, Akbateshi. Throughout his years on the Golden Stool, Oseakoto would prove to be about the furthest thing from a functioning alcoholic. According to historical writings of a later Ashanti monarch, King Oseya was drunk every hour of the day, and because of this became so cruel and arbitrary that he frequently ignored the advice of the elders. He showed up to Kotoko meetings in an inebriated stupor, that is, when he showed up. During many of the scheduled meetings of the assembly of the king's most powerful and close advisors, Osea Koto just chose to ditch the meeting altogether. At first, the frustrated Kotoko started sending out teams to look for the king, only to almost certainly find him in the same spot, the royal vacation home. This palace, built on the outskirts of Kumasi, was intended to act as an occasional refuge, on the rare occasion that the most powerful man in Ashantima needed respite from the political hustle and bustle of the royal palace. Under Osei Koto, it became the royal palace. The king spent almost every waking hour at the resort getting hammered with his friends, who consisted of whoever could offer the king the most intense and poetic praise at any given moment. While the king was happy to spend time with anyone willing to act sycophantic enough, he primarily amused himself with three particular friends who would prove to be problematic in upholding the king's reputation. Two of these friends were a pair of twin brothers, Atapanin and Atakoma. With descent from an important noble family from just outside Kumasi, Atapanin and Atakoma were notoriously bad influences on the Ashanti monarch. If you've ever been to college, imagine the most archetypical legacy admission student, combined with the most stereotypical Hollywood frat bro, and you have a decent image of the Atta twins in your head. Due to their noble heritage, the two were well known for their entitled behavior. They befriended the king during his teenage years, and had always had a reputation for troublemaking. Their close relationship with Ose Koto, as well as the special treatment that this relationship rewarded them, only made their worst traits more visible. The two were noted for their egotistical and somewhat narcissistic behavior, parading around the streets of Komasi drunk and angrily demanding that random citizens kneel before them or otherwise show them unearned deference. They were also notoriously prone to random violence, often getting into occasionally lethal arguments with commoners and other elites alike, only for their friend, the Shantahene, to hastily grant his drinking buddies a pardon so they could keep attending his perpetual wild parties. If these two weren't a bad enough influence, Osei Koto had another drinking buddy, the unpredictable and likely psychopathic Kotiako. Kotiako was, unlike many of the elites in Komasi, not originally from the city. Rather, he was from the nearby city of Juaben, one of the most important Ashanti cities in the domain of the Juaben Hene Kwakoboaten, one of the permanent members of the Kotoko Council. Now, Osei Koto would develop something of a running feud with the current Juaben Hene. You see, Juaben was the definition of a city on the come up. Its economy was flourishing due to its geographic position between two of the Ashanti's major trade hubs, the Gonja city of Salaga and the capital Kumasi. You see, Salaga was basically the gate between the Sahel and the forest region, so due to its position between the two important cities, Juaben could basically act as a second gate in the Sahel Ashanti trade in Kola, gold, and enslaved people. Now, Juaben's rise as an economic powerhouse had previously not been much of an issue, because Boaten had been a close friend and loyal associate of Osebonso, 
Osiakoto, always resentful of those who associated with his brother, developed a deep disdain for the king of Joaben on a personal level. Because of this disdain, Joaben's rise went from a fortunate development for the Ashanti Empire to a matter of tension and competition with the city of Komasi. Throughout his reign, Osiakoto would do everything in his power to sabotage Boaten. In the lead-up to the Battle of Kadamanso, the Ashantahene accused the king of Joaben of intentionally slowing down his march by taking too many breaks for religious observances and sacrifices. This is kind of poetic. As you might recall, in the lead-up to the war with Jaman, Osiakoto's brother had been zealous in his adherence to religious ceremonies to aid his chances in battle. Osiakoto, on the other hand, is getting upset because his ally in the war is giving too much effort in observing these traditions. Kind of a dramatic contrast, no? Later, in an incident when the Joabenhene's war materials went missing, Boaten apparently asked the Ashantahene if he knew anything about their whereabouts. Osekoto took this as an accusation of theft, and threatened to have Boaten tried for treason against the Golden Stool. The Joabenhene backed down. However, if Osekoto was a little bit petty and annoying before his defeat at Katamanso, you better believe he was a lot worse afterwards. Remember how, during the Battle of Katamanso, Osekoto allegedly fled and left behind the Golden Stool, nearly losing the Sacrosanct Artifact in the process? Well, fortunately, an Aquamu mercenary in the Ashanti army managed to scoop up the stool before it was lost, and return the stool to the nearest Ashanti authority, who happened to be Boaten. When Boaten returned to Kumasi to present the recovered stool, using a piece of cloth to avoid touching the stool directly with his hands, Osiakoto was waiting for him. With a bottle of rum in his hand, and humiliated by the fact that someone other than himself had rescued the stool, the king exploded into a drunken tantrum, alleging that the stool was missing some of its precious stones and bells engraved within. Of course, these missing pieces were almost certainly his own fault, given that Osiakoto had, you know, toss the stool onto the ground of an active battlefield, where things can get damaged easily. But, rather than accepting the blame himself, Osekoto instead accused Boaten of stealing those stones. Now, this is a very serious accusation. Remember that even touching the golden stool with your bare hands was an executable offense, much less stealing precious stones off of it. However, Osekoto had no way to prove this very serious allegation so under immense pressure, he was forced to retract. Finally, their rivalry reached its climax with, of all things, a succession dispute over a minor noble title in a tiny town. The stool of a noble family from the town of Nsuta, a small exurb of Mampong, was vacant after the nobleman holding the position died at the Battle of Karamanso. Two nephews of the nobleman competed over who was the rightful heir to the stool. However, this claimant possessed a long history of friendship with Boaten, so the other claimant contested this idea. Instead, the two carried their dispute to the highest legal authority in the empire, the Ashantahene. And look, this next part, I'll admit, sounded pretty propaganda-like. When reading the official histories, I thought that it was too ridiculous to sound like something I should just accept as true. And knowing about the future history of the Ashanti Empire, I thought it clearly sounded like an invented story to besmirch Osiakoto's reputation. I scoured every library, every database, and every journal I could find for anything resembling a challenge to the official story here, and I found nothing. I'm kind of forced to tentatively accept it. The official story, and maybe you'll see why I'm so skeptical, is that apparently the two rival claimants of the Insulta Stool invited Osiakoto to the hearing. Apparently, the king let the two claimants make their cases for a while before it came up in the conversation that one of the claimants happened to be a friend of Boaten. After hearing this, the king immediately threw out the case, made up a criminal charge on the spot, and had Boaten's friend imprisoned and executed. Yes, he hated Boaten so much that he decided to randomly murder a guy just for being associated with him. And I can accept that Osekoto was a pretty irresponsible ruler and that he had this long-running feud with the Joabenhene, but this seems like such an escalation, going from like battlefield pettiness and then accusations of theft that he can't prove to just like murdering people in courtrooms. So yeah, do you see why I kind of suspect this of being propaganda? But again, after all of my research trying to find anything to challenge this so I could, you know, sort of teach the controversy here, there was nothing. This is the only narrative we have to go off of, so I guess I have to tentatively just say this is what we have. However, if you thought that murdering one of the Joabenhene's friends is an escalation, 
things are somehow about to get even more crazy. This, this story is pretty messed up. So if hearing about sexual assault is something you'd rather avoid, I advise you skip ahead by a bit. Anyways, in 1832, Osei Koto was partying and drinking, as he was known to do, when it came up in conversation just how much the Ashantahene despised the Joabenhene Boaten. Kochiako, Akoto's drinking buddy, came up with a plan on how he could help his best drinking buddy mess with his archenemy. You see, just by coincidence, apparently Kochiako somewhat resembled the Joabenhene. His face was a little bit similar, and he had a similar height and build. So, he hatched a plan. He would break into Boaten's house at night, steal his clothes, impersonate the Joabenhene, and then have sex with his wives. Now, hopefully I don't need to tell you this, but disguising yourself as someone else and fooling their loved ones into sex is, uh, definitely rape. Apparently, Osei Koto thought that this was a brilliant idea, and gave Kochiako the go-ahead to sexually assault his enemy's wives. So, Kochiako did exactly that. In the middle of the night, Kochako climbed through one of Boaten's windows, stole all of his clothes, and smothered all the lanterns in his house. When the king's wives came back from a night on the town and saw a man dressed in Boaten's clothes in the dark, they, of course, thought that it was their husband. However, right as Kochako's clothes came off, the ruse was up, and one of Boaten's wives realized that, in fact, the guy in the house was not their husband. She started screaming, and the other wives, hearing her screams, came into the bedroom and managed to force Kochako out of the house. Not wanting to get beat to death by a bunch of angry women, Kochako climbed back out the window and booked it for Kumasi, but not before one of the wives caught a glimpse of him in the streetlight and recognized his face. When informed of what transpired the next day, Boaten was, understandably, disturbed. Osei Koto had gone too far this time, and this behavior could no longer be ignored. Putting his foot down, he demanded that Osei Koto arrest Kochako at once and send him to Joaben to be tried and executed. In response, Osei Koto sent back a royal linguist, declining this demand. Boaten, now firmly enraged, decided to execute the king's linguist. With neither side budging, a violent confrontation was now inevitable. However, if it came to violence, everybody knew who had the upper hand. Sure, Joaben was an important city. It was arguably the second most important city in the empire and it could field a fairly impressive militia on a good day. But, at the end of the day, it was a city. It was just one city against an entire empire. Regardless, Boaten continued to prepare for war. Perhaps it was just blind rage fueling him, or perhaps he thought that other Ashanti nobility would turn against Osei as well. I mean, they had to see that the Ashantihene was causing problems too, right? Well, wrong. Such an uprising never manifested. In the waning months of 1832, the Ashanti army approached and besieged Joaben, and after a brief defense, Boaten, his army, and a crowd of Joaben refugees were forced to retreat. Fortunately for Boaten, the loss of Joaben didn't necessarily mean he had to surrender. Rather, he and his supporters fled to the southeast, into the predominantly Achem region surrounding the city of Chebi. While the Achem were technically under Ashanti domination, Osei Koto realized that any attempt to send an army into the Achem region would likely provoke yet another revolt, and so soon after the region had been pacified. So, he was forced to allow Boaten and his supporters to escape for now. However, Boaten's escape was not necessarily a get-out-of-jail-free card, as he could only stay in Achem for as long as the locals accepted his presence. At first, relations between Boaten and the Achem were pretty good. I assume their welcoming conversation must have been something like, Oh, why am I here? Because I hate the Ashantahene. Oh, you also hate the Ashantahene? Yeah, we'll get along just fine. But this wasn't going to last. Remember, the Joaben refugees were Ashanti, and many of them had served in the Ashanti army that had, so recently, waged war against the Achem. Many of the soldiers in Boatan's army, including Boatan himself, were themselves veterans of these campaigns. So, while the first conversation might have gone well, the second conversation must have been something like, Oh, wait, I recognize you. I think you killed my husband. Talk about awkward. After just a couple of years, this tension began to spill over into violence. Not to mention, tens of thousands of people streaming into a region all at once without planning will certainly cause some problems. Where would the Joaben refugees live? Well, the answer to that was a region just outside of Chebi, which quickly earned the nickname New Joaben. 
The city was, as a result of its rapid and ad hoc construction, and in its early years is better described as a large slum instead of an actual city. Not to mention, how are the refugees going to, you know, eat? Pretty much all of the viable land in Achem was owned by somebody, so the refugees couldn't farm for their own subsistence. They couldn't buy food from the Achem, as their possessions had been lost in the flight from their homes. So, facing potential starvation, many Joaben refugees decided to just, well, seize land, earning the ire of the locals. After just a couple of years, these tensions began to spill over into actual violence, with Joaben refugees getting into frequent violent clashes with Achem locals. This tension began to attract the eyes of outside powers. Hearing news of the brewing tensions in Achem, the British governor, who, remember, had never truly favored peace with the Ashanti anyways, began licking his lips at the possibility of weakening his rivals to the north, even mobilizing a small force at the Pra River just in case an opportunity to intervene presented itself. The Danish, spooked by the potential destabilization that would occur if tensions boiled over beyond Achem itself, also deployed a militia to the region, ostensibly to cool tensions. It seemed to everyone that, unless something changed now, another regional war was on the horizon. The Achem region was a powder keg. It was just a question of when it would be lit. However, in 1834, two years after the invasion of Joaben, a morbid blessing was shown upon the Ashanti Empire. Oseya Koto, the Ashantahene who presided over eight years of instability and civic decline, passed away after an extended bout of illness. He was only in his early 30s, quite early for the death of a monarch. Normally, this would lead to some suspicion of foul play, but given how Oseya Koto literally poisoned himself voluntarily by drinking multiple bottles of Akpateshi every day, somehow an early demise for him doesn't surprise me. So here's the closing question. Is Oseya Koto the worst Ashantahene of all time? Well, that's debatable, as we'll see some other strong contenders for the position in later episodes. But he's certainly on the short list, and I'd say the worst one we've seen so far. In just 11 years, Oseya Koto's rule, dominated by drunkenness, paranoid intrigue, and some downright psychotic behavior, managed to plunge the empire into the verge of civil war and, to be honest, frighteningly close to an outright collapse. But, as we know, the Ashanti Empire did not collapse in 1834. No, we still have 66 years of dramatic and fascinating stories, intrigue, and characters left to go. And if Ose Bonso was the last great Ashantehene, then Osei Koto's successor might be the contender for the last good Ashantehene. Join us next episode, as Ashantehene Kwakojoa tries his best to pick up the pieces of the Ashanti Empire, despite his predecessor doing his best to sabotage him, even from beyond the grave. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then we would love it if you could support the show. You can do this through supporting us monetarily at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, providing the show with a rating or a view on whichever platform you listen on, or sharing the show with anyone who you think might be interested in learning more about African history. This episode is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayo Fagbamie, Kevin Johnson, Morgan Blackmore, Sarah Mpenza, Tobias Tunglin, Dimitri, Emmanuel Zaudi, and Alexander Travis, among others.